Welcome to this presentation of version 18. More design, more applications, more productivity. The focus of this webinar is the reinforced concrete design checking, predominantly from LUSAS version 18, but also with a look back to version 17 and 16. I'm your host today. My name is Philip Ike, Marketing Director from LUSAS, and doing uh, live presentations today is Julian Moses. Hi there. Ably assisting us behind the glass is Paul Bellchamber, our marketing and sales support, and uh, he will be monitoring the chat. Please do ask questions during the event uh, in your webinar uh, dialogue. We'll attempt to answer those on the fly as we go. We have Q&A sessions through the event, and uh, so we'll stop and answer some of the more salient questions during those. And finally, at the end of the event, or rather after the event, we'll have a webinar recording that we will make available to all registrants. So LUSAS version 18 has a host of new facilities in it, but essentially delivers on three main areas. So the first is the reinforced concrete frame design, and that's the main area for this webinar. Um, but it also delivers on enhanced rail capability, so that's adding specifically the optimization of rail load positions on civil structures, and also um, advances to our concrete facilities. This is specifically the concrete cracking crushing, creep, and shrinkage capability, um, along with high-growth thermal mechanical for understanding the early age behavior of concrete systems. Now, LUSAS has been uh, known for decades as a highly advanced analytical system, allowing you the uh, ability to look at steel, um, non-linearity, steel yielding, concrete, cracking and crushing, um, soil plasticity and soil structure interaction, um, looking into time history dynamics that incorporates non-linearity, construction phases with time dependency, flow, be that heat or uh, fluid state flow, and many other things beside. We are a highly capable and advanced analytical system. Where we've changed, particularly in the last few years, is in extending the workflow from analysis into design with uh, comprehensive design checking and critically delivering um, advanced uh, reporting along with that. So it's sectional design that's been um, the major change for us in the last two years. And if we take a look back at version 16, that delivered a totally new um, way of delivering design for steel frames. Along with that, we also improved our reinforced concrete slab and wall design. That forms the latter part of this presentation. Version 17 was largely about post-tensioning, so new tools based around codes of practice for inserting and managing tendons better and looking at creep and time stage management. Version 18, the new release, is essentially about RC frame design. But of course, we're not finished there. In version 19, we're extending that to a new composite deck design utility. We already have a EC4 deck designer, but the new utility will operate in a quicker, easier way, um, be uh, valid for more than just the Euro code, and features behind it a new tool for parameter parameterized bridge modeling. Design for us is about obviously serving as much of the globe as we can. Predominantly, we operate um, in Europe, North America, into the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Australasia. But obviously, in countries like South America and um, Africa, for instance, many of those codes are also useful in those areas. The RC Frame Designer is an extension to two existing concrete facilities. One is the Steel and Composite Deck Designer. So within that, you have the ability to design a reinforced concrete deck integral with uh, underlying steel beams, and that's done to the Eurocode. We also have, and we'll be showing later, 
the RC slab and wall designer, and that's to a multitude of international codes of practice. The RC frame designer can be used on any infrastructure type, obviously beams and columns in buildings, um, decks and piers within bridges, and both those will be shown in the live presentations today, but it doesn't end there. If you're looking at ground structures, for instance, pile groups, ring beams, props and excavations, anything that's essentially a reinforced concrete member can be designed with this utility. And the RC frame designer is delivering initially to the European Code of Practice. So we have EN 1992 to both the buildings and bridges parts. And then in version 19, we're delivering on additional codes, primarily Ashto and the Indian, with others to be confirmed shortly. Now, the frame design doesn't just deliver on simple sections. So, yes, of course, we can design rectangle, square, circle, TL type sections, your traditional building sections. But what we've also built in is complex capability. So anything in LUSAS that you define from our section libraries, which can be more complex sections, or that you define using our arbitrary section calculator, can be taken forward into the reinforced concrete designer. And notionally, there's no limit on the number of faces that you can place reinforcement against. It's not only sophisticated in cross-section, but also in elevation. So if you, clearly a prismatic section is dealt with, but you can also include tapering. And that tapering can be linear tapering, but also non-linear. So if you've got variations that are cubic, um, or uh, spline type, uh, then you can also include those. Now, a major part of these new design utilities is the level of result output that you're getting. So whether you're looking at serviceability, so for instance, cracking calculations and seeing where the crack section um, occurs, or whether you're looking at ultimate limit state and getting an understanding of the capacity of the section, and its utilization versus applied loads in bending. These are all catered for in detail within the program. And those items can also be passed outwards into the um, reports. So LUSAS version 16 had a new report generator that allows you to work either on the fly, so generating a custom report, or working from uh, templates that you may save away on your server for the use of all your teams. The great advantage of this report is any changes to the model can be automatically reflected in the report. So any change is efficiently dealt with. Now at that point, I'm going to pass forward to, uh, to Julian to run through a demonstration. And this is broken in two. So demonstration number one is based around a simple building frame. And here we're just going to look at some fairly basic bar arrangements. June will then go forward to look at a slightly more challenging bridge structure where we'll look at arbitrary section types, tapering, um, and the complex uh, or sophisticated, I should say, report generation capability. So, Julian, I'll, um, I'll pass to you. Okay, thanks, Phil. Okay, so what I'm going to do for the, the first one is load up a version 17 model. So, you don't have to now just create the, uh, the model in version 18. I can load up an old model and add reinforcement to it. So, file open. And it's just this simple building model I'm going to open up. It's just a simple four-story building. I've set up some load cases on it. And once it appears, I'll just start to look at the actual model itself. OK, so it's telling me I need to convert it because it's a version 17 model. That's fine. OK, so it's a basic model. I've got some load cases already set up with some of the dead loads, panel loads, and various uh, other loadings on the model. Now, what I need to do to to use the design module is set up a number of things. First of all, go to the design menu, RC frame design. You can choose which of the national annexes you want to work with. I'm going to work with the United Kingdom. And you can choose whether you want to work with the building part or the bridge part of the design code. Obviously, I'm looking at a building here, so I'm going to go with the dash one. And we've got the national annex um, parameters here. You can change those, but I'm just going to leave those as they are. OK, so that's defined which design code and which part of the design code I'm going to work with. What I now need to do is add some design attributes. So if I go to the Attributes tab, down to the Design item, and RC Frame Design. 
Now, what this design attribute will allow me to do is set up the way things like the ULS calculations are done, the SS calculations, the way the elastic modulus is calculated for the creep calculations. So all of these can be changed. I'm just going to leave with the defaults. And on tab one here, the general tab, most crucially, I need to define my minimum and maximum reinforcements for a beam section or a column section because they're different. So I'm going to create two design attributes, one called beam. And I'm going to swap over and create one for the column as well. So, and OK, that. So there are my two design attributes. They're not assigned at the moment. So what I want to do is go to the geometric sections here, right hand mouse button, select assignments. I just need to switch on my geometry layer before I do that. So, OK, so select assignments. And that will pick all the lines representing the beams in the model. And I'm going to assign the beam design attributes. Second section here, if I select assignments, that will select all the lines representing the columns, and I can define those as well. Okay, so I've assigned my design attributes to my beams and columns. The final thing I need to do is define some reinforcement layouts. So let me go to one of the sections here. If I double click on it, this is the typical uh, geometric attribute dialog. But if you've got the RC module, you'll see you've got an extra item here now that allows you to define the reinforcement. I haven't got any reinforcement in this model because it came in from version 17. So new, and now I can now start to define my reinforcement. Now here I can define different sections of reinforcement along a single line. And we're gonna look at that in the next example I look at. But for this one, I'm just gonna define one cross section along the whole line. So I'm going here, new, and this is now the details of the reinforcement I'm going to set up. So I'm going to allow a 30 mil cover and an allowance for a link of 10 millimeters. If I now go to the layers of rebar, I can start to set up what types of rebar I want in each faces. Now for this square section, we've got four faces and I'm going to deal with face number one first of all. And I'm going to put three bars into that face and the bar diameter I'm going to put in as 20 mil. And there you can see three bars. Now, the reason they're blue at the moment is because that's the active layer that I'm looking at. Now, if I add a new layer to this uh, cross section, you'll see the bars have gone red now. And that's because there's a clash. Both of these definitions are saying face one at the moment. So I've got two sets of bars on top of each other. So let's change this second one to be face three. And then you'll see that the blue bars jump to the top because that's the active layer. So we've got some bottom and top reinforcement. So let's add us some in the side. So I'm going to add, and this is going to be phase two. Now, as I do that, you'll see that I've got a blue bar in the middle, but the red bars are in corners, there's a clash. And that's because the bottom face and the side face have got doubling up on bars in the corners. Now to get over that, I can basically choose how I want the end bars to be considered. So for the face, I'm going to admit both the end bars. So I'm just dealing with the middle bar there. Finally, I'm going to add a fourth face in, and that's going to be face four there. So a very simplistic uh, reinforcement layout, but that's fine. So I'm going to give this a name now. And OK, that's, and I'm going to give this a name reinforcement layout. And OK. OK, so I've created my reinforcement for this section. If I go to the next section now, rather than actually defining the reinforcement, because I have now one defined in my model, I can actually choose to use that again for this particular layout here. So I can use the same bars in two different sections. Now, what I've done here is obviously very simplistic, and actually things will be more complicated than that. Now, rather than look at this particular model, I'm going to jump to a more complicated model to look at. And this is going to be a, a bridge model. Now, in this bridge model, we've already set the design code to the Eurocodes part two. And we've also designed the, defined the design attributes. We've also set up the um, engineering properties for the layouts so of the reinforcement. So if I look at this arch section here, we've got some reinforcement. And if I were to look at this and edit it, 
you'll see the reinforcement here. Now, if I scroll into this, you can see that we've got a more complex reinforcement layout here. So in the bottom face, we've got two layers of reinforcement. We've also got it, so we've got alternate bars in one of the faces. So we've got a big bar, a smaller bar, big bar. So you can set up quite complex reinforcement patterns. I'm going to close that down and look at another section. Here we've got a tapering section. So part of the arch is tapering from a, a large rectangular section to a small rectangular section. Now, because the reinforcement is defined in the faces, it's very easy for us to put the faces in and then it will work with these tapering sections. Finally, I'm going to look at the deck section because this is the most complex section we've got in this model. And again, I'm going to edit the reinforcement. Now, here you can see that I've got different sections of reinforcement set up for different portions of the line. So essentially, for the first two and a half meters of this deck section, we've got a different reinforcement layout. The ends are the same, but in the middle, we've got a different set, and that's going to stretch to fit the line that we've got in this section. If I edit the detail reinforcement and look at the rebar, you can see that I've got quite a complex rebar set up for this particular section. So we can work with anything from just simple rectangles to more complicated shapes such as this deck section. Now what I'm going to do with this model is I'm now going to go on and look at the actual design calculations for this reinforcement. Now to do that I need to set up a design results attribute, so design, RC frame design results. Now this is allowing me to choose which part of the model I want to work with so I'm going to choose all members in this particular case and where you want the calculations to be carried out so at the moment if you leave this on nodes the calculation will be carried out at the ends of the elements if I change to internal points it would basically calculate at 11 positions along each element so much more calculations being done but you'll then get a finer sort of uh, display of the results for this particular demonstration, I'm just going to leave it at the nodes. Here, I'm going to set up how my load groups are acting with my model. Now, if I just cancel that for the moment and look at my analysis tab, what you'll see is I've used the combination builder to basically build ULS and SLS combinations, and it's these that I'm now going to associate in that design results attribute of which load groups are associated with the ULS and SLS checks. So, if I go back in here, so for the ULS checks, I'm going to select the envelope of the ULS effects, which is that one there. For the SLS characteristic checks, I'm going to select the ULS envelope, which is 46, that one, 46. And for the quasi-permanent, I'm just going to select that load case there. And that's OK. So this is setting up what loads are going to be used against which of the design checks. So OK that. And I'm ready to start to look at my reinforcement layout. So if I set this as active, down at the bottom here you'll see a taskbar as the calculations are performed. And once the calculations have been calculated, in this case you should see some results being displayed at node locations. Now, it takes a few seconds, but there are the results. Now, what we're looking at here is colored sort of blobs at the node locations, and we're looking at the utilization of the ULS check at the moment. Now, if I were to just zoom into this part of the model, yeah, you'll see that this location we have three results, and that's because we've got the vertical member and we've got the two arch members coming in there. And it's the vertical members of the highest loaded in this particular case. Now, in terms of the results, I could look at any of the results individually on the screen using the check here. But if I wanted to look at all the results, I can look at a table summary by basically right hand mouse button, show results. Again, this takes a few seconds to build, but it will give me a summary of all the design checks that have been taking place and it will show me by colouring them whether they've passed or failed the particular checks that I'm interested in. Okay, so it's nearly done and the check should appear on the screen. 
So here we've got the, the line numbers, the elements, and where the node is. That's telling me the information. And then we've got the results of the ULS, SLS checks. This colored bar down the side here is indicating green, it's passed. And if I scroll down, you'll see some sections that have failed. And it tells me which is the failing calculation. Now, if I want to look in more detail in this, what I can do is I can click here. And it will show me then the detailed calculations that have been carried out for this particular location. It will show me a representation of the section, the reinforcement in the section, where the neutral axis is. And if I scroll down the left hand side here, it will show me the detailed calculations that are being performed. And if I jump to the bottom, it will show me the one in red that's failing. And so there we go. There's the one I would need to check. Now, I could go in and modify the reinforcement or increase the section size until I got this to pass effectively. Now, these calculations can be viewed on screen, but as Phil said earlier, I can add them to the LUSAS report so you can get a hard copy of these out in the model. And if you change your model, these calculations will automatically update. Now, as well as the calculations we're seeing on the screen here, there are other things I can look at. So I can look at the interaction diagram. So this is looking at a 2D interaction diagram. Now, at the moment, what we're looking at is uh, different axial forces and the moment resistance that's being calculated. Now, if I just set this number to 2, it should just show me where we're at at the moment. So this is the, the moment resistance that's been calculated at the given axial load. And the blue dot there is where we're at in the model. The black outline is the capacity of the section. I change this back to 15. I can also look at this in a 3D view. So there's the limit that we're at at the moment. But this allows me to see what happens if I increase or reduce my axial load and how that affects the sort of the moment resistance. Because in some cases, you might find by reducing the axial load, the, the section might start to fail. So it's quite a nice little image to look at in terms of these. So either in 2D or 3D. And again, these can be added to the reports if you want. So I'm just going to close that down. So hopefully what I've tried to do is show you how simple and easy it is to define reinforcement and then go on to look at design calculations. These design calculations can be stored in the LUSAS report. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Phil to look at the next section. Okay, Julian, uh, thank you for that. Um, we're just going to take a, a pause at this point to look at some questions. Um, so we've got a, got a variety on here. Um, there are a few relating to codes of practice. Um, so we've got a, a question on um, assessment codes as well as design codes and some international codes, Julian, including Australian. Yeah. Um, as I say, well, we are... Of... We're rolling out um, different codes. We're hoping to get the Australian into next version, version 19, but we'll keep you updated of that. So there is a, a program of codes being released. Let's have a look at one of the other codes, um, questions here. Um, one of the questions is mixing uh, shear wall elements and beam elements. Yeah. Now, in the fr building frame that we looked at, uh, it was just a very simple model. I was only looking at the frame elements. But there's nothing stopping me actually modeling the, the floors in the building. What we're actually doing in that particular model is we were using the floor loading to distribute the load to the beams. But if I wanted to, I could actually put those uh, floor loads or those floors into the model itself. And I could then design those with the slab designer that I'm going to go on and show you later. Um, another question there is specific, specifically on floor loads into beams. Mm -hmm. I think that the model that was shown had UDLs on the boundary beams. Yes. Um, you can also, we have a floor loading generator where you can um, uh, define what shape or what type mm -hmm. of um, distribution you want to go onto the boundary beam. Yeah, yeah I, I, I was using that in the UDLs. Um, I had it as one-way spanning concrete slabs, effectively. Um, so I wasn't using a sort of two-way spanning distribution. It was just simple one-way. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of other questions here to do with um, what we'll provide after the event. Can we share information models, PDS, and so on? Um, the answer is yes, and we will uh, alert you with those after the event. 
Um, I think what we'll do is we'll move forwards from here. There are some more questions coming in um, live at the moment, but I think we'll maybe leave some of those other ones until the end. Uh, so let's move forward now to the next part of the presentation. Um, before I do that, I should mention that the RC Frame Designer is, so for those of you that are existing users of Lusas, if you want this, it's an optional upgrade and you'll need a new key in order to run it. We have a 50% offer running at the moment and that will end, end in, uh, yeah, end of September, 30th September. If you'd like to apply online, go to the Lusas Releases website. You can find Upgrade Me within there. Um, otherwise, obviously, if you just mail your account manager, uh, they'd be happy to assist you. Uh, furthermore, uh, well, in fact, as I say, we have a few queries um, live about how can we get help, what other information can you share with us. Again, for those of you that are existing users, there is an example in the examples manual. So if you have upgraded to version 18, you'll be able to find the example that's on the screen at the moment. And this is a very explicit example. There's every step of what's being done through the design process. Uh, so it's, um, it's pretty easy to follow and it should give you a comprehensive idea of, of how to use this new utility. So that takes us from um, the frame design. We're now moving into slab and wall designer. So in version 16, we made an upgrade to what is generally described as the slab designer. It's something of a misnomer. Uh, we prefer really to communicate it as the slab and wall designer because it does more than just um, uh, building slabs and, uh, and deck slabs. Now, one of the reasons that uh, it's changed is from version 16, it moved from being um, just a bending only or a wood armor uh, based system to incorporate the Clark-Nielsen calculations. So Clark-Nielsen allows in-plane forces to be looked at. And uh, this gives you quite a large range of options for the type of structures that you can now look at. When you're using it, you make a decision on either assessing an existing arrangement of reinforcement. So you would put in your layers top and bottom, uh, define them as bar sizes and spacing, and you can have as many um, different arrangements as you want around your model. Or you can say that you'd like to work with a certain bar size and have Lusas tell you what sort of spacing you want to use. Or finally, the third option is you describe the spacing and Lusas will tell you what bar size you need to use. So you can use it as a sort of designer or as a checker. The products, similarly to the RC frame designer, um, and especially with the upgrade in version 16, it becomes very broadly applicable to various infrastructure types. So whether you're looking at buildings, slabs and walls, as we've mentioned, bridges uh, with their decks, swing walls, abutments, or any other civil structure that is, I suppose you would say, a shell type structure, um, you can do the reinforcing calculation using this designer. So that's helpful in tunnels, retaining walls, and containment. And in fact, it's containment that we're going to be looking at with the, uh, the live presentation. It's also available to a variety of codes of practice, and in fact, a broad set of codes as well from North America through Europe into Asia and Australasia. And with each release, we work very hard on our codes of practice, so you'll see these changing, um, and it's worth checking with each release that you get if you are using one of these design utilities, what the updates to the codes of practice are. So I'm going to pass um, back to Julian and um, we'll look at the design of a reinforced concrete tank. Okay, so for this example, I'm, I'm just going to start from fresh. I'm, I'm going to build a complete model and look at reinforcement. So I'm just going to start by creating a three-dimensional model. And this is going to be a simple circular tank. It's going to be not post-tensioned, so um, it's going to be tightness class zero, so I can get away with using the uh, section one of the Eurocos effectively. Okay, so I'm going to start by putting some just geometry lines in. So I'm going to start with zero, zero, but minus six in the Z direction. And this is going to go five meters in the X direction. Now the reason I'm putting this as minus six in the Z direction 
is I'm going to create a water pressure variation with depth. So it will increase with the depth of the model. Okay, so there's my line. I'm going to select the end of this point line here, and I'm going to sweep it in the X direction by 10 meters, and also in the Z direction by 3 meters. So it creates this kink line. I'm going to take the end of this line, and I'm going to sweep that in the Z direction by 3 meters. And there's the sort of section that I'm going to use. Now, this is a circular tank, so what I'm going to do is take all of those lines, and I'm going to sweep it by rotation about the Z axis. So sweep by rotation of 90 degrees. And what that will do is create a quarter of the tank model for me. I can then take this whole section, and I can copy by a rotation of 90 degrees three times and that will create the whole tank for me. So very simple geometry to create. So now let's have a look at the engineering properties. So mesh, surface, I'm going to work with thick shells here, I'm going to work with quadratic elements, so I'll just call this thick shell, and I'm going to put an element size of one meter. So if I pick everything and drag this on, I will then get some mesh occurring. Now, for the walls, I've got a very regular mesh. For the base slab, I've got an irregular mesh. So I would probably need to use a local coordinate system to transform the results for the, the base. For the walls, I don't need to do that. OK, so let's put some thicknesses to this section. So I'm just going to make the walls and base the same thickness, keep it simple. So 300 mil thick. So when I drop on the thickness, I will get a visualization of the thickness being shown to me. So there you can see how thick it is. I'm just going to switch that off, go back to the wire diagram. Materials, I'm just going to use a standard concrete from the material library. So concrete, I'm going to use EN 1991, and I'm going to have a, a 30 mix. And OK. Again, I'm going to assign that to everything. Now for the... Support, I'm going to just support the base of the tank, and I'm going to use sort of very simplistic soil springs for this. So, support. So, I'm going to use spring stiffness, and I'm going to put a spring stiffness of 10E3, and I'm going to put that in three directions. And I'm going to do that stiffness per unit area, and I'm just going to call this soil. Okay, the easiest way of picking the base is if I click in the X box down at the bottom here, I can look side on to it, so I can just grab the base and drag those soil supports on. Okay, so there's my sort of spring supports representing the soil. I'm just going to switch those off. And finally, I need to put some loading on this. So if I go to the uh, Analysis tab, I'm going to right-hand mouse button on low case 1, switch on gravity. I'm also, while I'm here, just going to rename this just a dead load, DL. So that's my dead load. Now, as I said, I want to put on some water loading on this, but I want the water loading to increase with the sort of depth as we go through this. Now to do that, I'm going to create a variation. Now that variation in this case is going to be a field variation. Now field variations vary things in the global X, Y, and Z direction. Now the variation that I'm going to use here is very simple. It's just a linear variation. I'm going to have minus Z times one, one being the bulk density of the water effectively in this case. And I'm just going to call this water pressure. Now I'm going to assign this to a, a local distributed load. So attributes loading. And I'm going to use a local distributed load. And that's going to be per unit area. And all this is going to be is minus 9.81 and times the variation that I've just created. Now to get to the variation, I click in this down arrow here, and it will allow me to select the variation that I've just created. So that's the intensity of my load, and I'm just going to call this water load. And I'm basically going to pick everything and drag that water load on there, and I'm going to put it into a locus of cool water. Now, what you should see when the loading arrows appear is that we get loading arrows on the model, but there are no loading arrows at the very top of the tank here. And that's because if you evaluate that variation, that variation is zero at this level. 
every meter I go down into the tank, the variation will increase by one effectively. So at the bottom, I have six times the load that I have at the top effectively. So simple water variations. Now, in this particular model, I'm just doing something very simplistic, two low cases. So I could go on and use my combination builder to build a combination, but I'm just going to do this manually. It's very simple. So smart combination. I'm going to include my two low cases, put some factors on them. So 1.1, 1.5, and I'm just going to call this combination ULS. And I can now run it and look at the results. So if I run this, Okay, now because I've got this sort of regular mesh on the walls and a regular mesh down here, I would need to use a local coordinate system to post-process the base separately from the walls. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this one wall here, this, this surface here, and I'm just going to look at that on its own. It just keeps it simple, so keep us only visible. Okay, I'm going to switch off my deform mesh and just switch off the loading arrows. So I could start to look at results on this wall. So I could start to look at a bending moment. So contours of force moments. And I could look at the MX direction. So there's my bending moment in the X direction. I could also look at the bending moment in the Y direction. But actually what I want to do is start to look at some reinforcement on this uh, wall section. So in here, I'm going to design, uh, define some reinforcement. Now, for this particular model, I'm just going to have 12 mil bars at 150 in both directions. And I'm going to leave the cover as 50 mil and just call this RC layout. And I'm going to assign it to this surface here. OK, so now I've assigned that to the surface. I can use the RC designer to look at the reinforcement and the utilization on this section. So design, RC slab design. So in here, I can choose which of the design codes I want to work with. So it could be Australia, it could be United States. I'm going to work with United Kingdom here, and I'm going to use the part one of the code. But there are other codes in there, so I'm going to use that. And I'm going to look at the Clark-Nielsen forces. So rather than just looking at the bending components, I'll be looking at the sort of actual components as well. The defaults here I'm going to leave. If I go next, this is allowing me to adjust how the calculations are being done. But that's fine. I'm going to leave the defaults there. OK, so now what this allows me to do is rather than just looking at moments on my section, if I go to my contours, I can look at ULS design calculations. And I could start to look at various components. So I'm going to look at util max in the top surface. And this is showing me here, I've got a utilization of about 25%. If I were to look at the utilization of the bottom surface, again, about 23%. Now, at the moment, I'm just looking at the water load. So if I set the combination active, you can see that utilization goes up to about 45% in terms of the layout that I've got. But this is a very simplistic model. It's only a couple of load cases. Now, what I could also go on and do is put things like uh, pressure loads for the soil pushing against the tank. I could look at tank being filled with water or empty of water. Lots of different low cases I could put together. But for this simple presentation, I've just tried to concentrate on the model building and defining the reinforcement. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Phil. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll take a, a pause at this point for, for questions. Some of the questions kind of refer to the previous one. Let's just do the, um, the tank and, uh, and shells to start with. Uh, for water heights, Ju Julian looked at a particular water height. It is worth saying we've had a question on varying water heights. Yes, it's fairly trivial, actually, to set up different heights. Having set up that one variation, just to set it at a new datum point that it's it's being calculated from and look at sort of empty, full, partially filled uh, yeah. conditions. The tank that was shown obviously was um, was a fairly minor height, so it's uh, 
uh, I think those sort of intermediate positions would have been of less interest. Um, Julian, did we've had a question on saw loads onto the walls. Ju Julian actually did just mention um, that he could look ha have looked specifically at setting up the soil um, as loads onto the wall. That is possible. Um, but Julian, there are also other ways maybe of dealing with soil. You could go anywhere from using a soil joint element that would have sort of active passive pressure on it to even embedding the tank in a, in, in a continuum where the continuum represents the real behavior of the soil. It just depends what level you want to go to with the soil structure and traction. Um, we've obviously done very simplistic modeling of the soil springs here, but th this is just the beginning. You could go to whatever level you wanted to go to. Okay. Um, another thing that you could potentially do as well is model it, this is three-dimensional, you could model it as an axisymmetric. Yes, you could, yeah. And, uh, and then use an axisymmetric representation for the soil as well if you're a little bit uh, cautious about using volumes for soils um, due to the size and complexity of the model. Uh, we've had various questions as well on um, import and export from CAD, not just in, in this session but in the previous one as well. It's probably just worth reiterating. DXF we support. I mean, if you want to go in and out of Lusas that way, that's that's probably the most generally used one. Um, IFC went into version 16, and um, would we advise that that's the one that they would normally? Um, IFC to is the one or? that's obviously being developed now for for BIM capabilities. Hmm. I use a mixture of DXF, IGIS, whatever is to hand really. Yeah, so I just is giving you a little bit more than DXF in the sense that you can look at surfaces and volumes. It can handle more reason. complicated geometry, yeah. Yes, okay. Um, what we can see as well is, um, particularly in the last session, there are a lot of queries about individual codes of practice, um, regional codes of practice, um, assessment versus design codes of practice. Uh, I think rather than go into the details of this, because we're being asked some very specific questions here about clauses from codes, we will come back um, separately on a, on a lot of those. What we would also like to do anyway is um, for some of the more uh, sort of pertinent questions um, to share those generally with people after the event as well. Um, but I think at that point it would be good to, um, to carry on and, uh, and to move forward. Okay, so um, we've talked really about concrete design. Uh, I'd like to just talk a little bit more about some of the underlying analytical capabilities and how they've changed with version 18. Um, so one side of that is how we deal with the nonlinear and um, time dependency uh, of concrete. So the first side is cracking and crushing behavior has been available in LUSAS for some time. Um, it's been updated in version 18. Uh, we can certainly assist users in, in using it. You can take your parameters from testing. There are various guidances inside codes of practice for how you um, set up your material properties. Once you set those up, you can then run an analysis and get a, uh, a true assessment, if you will, of cracks around uh, the model. So if you're using volumetrics, you'll see cracks appearing all the way um, through the volume. Um, you can also use cracks in shells, um, so they apply to a variety of, of element types. Um, in terms of that crack width calculation, so we have that based on the sort of pure um, micro-mechanical science. Uh, we also have it um, according to EN 1992, so that's the Eurocode calculation for cracking around reinforcing bars is now also um, within the LUSAS interface. Big change with um, version 18 is, is creep and shrinkage, an extension to codes of practice that are supported, but I think the, the sort of critical side to this is now creep and shrinkage is properly um, available in combination with the cracking and crushing model. So a nice advance there for those that want to move to more advanced concrete behavior. And I'd say looking at some of the questions we have here, and we have a lot on reinforced concrete assessment, Obviously, it's an assessment that you'll tend to um, move into more pure analytical methods because you want to understand why a structure cracked or, or deflected in the way that it did um, on site. We also have a new utility for um, early age behavior in concrete. So we call this hydrothermal mechanical. Um, it's a very long name. 
for a product which essentially gives you the ability to model the curing process of concrete. Um, this is largely automated now in terms of the material properties and the loadings that you put into uh, the interface. And it will give you as results temperature profiles, stress and strain profiles, and particularly obviously on the base of the strain, uh, an indication of the cracking that occurs around the concrete sections. So then it's to the engineer obviously to decide, well, how do we deal with the um, cracking issues or, or other curing issues during construction. Do we limit pore size? Um, do we look at extra reinforcement? Do we try and duct heat out of the system? All of those are available as utilities within uh, LUSAS, and it's a rather nice addition, particularly obviously for constructors and, and contractors. If you want to learn, um, again, more about the advanced material capability uh, in version 18, then the hygrothermal is one of those um, additions. So we have a new example sitting within the examples manual. So that really takes us to the end of the technical side of the presentation. We want to make sure that everybody's getting as much out of these events as, as they can do. So we will start to post media onto our website which relates to the event. So that'll be things like videos, um, potentially sort of data files and PDFs that we would look to share with you. And these will also go up through our other channels. So we have Facebook, YouTube and uh, LinkedIn predominantly as our social media platforms. But if you would like um, other assistance, obviously do not forget our technical support team, highly rated and, and much valued by our customers around the world. And um, we've had something of a change to the team, so a few fresh new faces um, that you can see on the screen there. And they will help you not only um, as part of your lease um, arrange, uh, uh, arrangement um, with us for LUSAS, but if you want to be specifically trained, you can come to us. Uh, we run scheduled courses in this office. We can also come to you. Uh, so we can do bespoke offices to content that relates to your requirements. So please get in contact with us if you want to know more. So that's it really. Um, leaves me to say thank you and goodbye. So that's goodbye from me. Uh, thank you. Nice to meet <laughs> And Paul will say goodbye from behind the glass. Thank you very much for your time in this event and we look forward to seeing you on the next one at some point in the near future. Thank you and goodbye.